I'm Lynn Scheller and I'm with the Library Foundation of Hillsborough. I'm a board member. WOW is, is the, an acronym for World of Wonder. And we as a foundation decided that we were a little tired of our typical dinner with an author every year. So this year we came up with the idea of having a series of programs that were unusual and would make you go, Wow. <laughs> we tried to think of something that would be interesting to people of all ages and all just all types of people and food is definitely something we're all interested in. <laughs> and then tonight was our final program and it was Mark Bitterman, an award-winning author, talking about salt, salts of the world. And again, kind of a common thread here, how salts are important to all the various cultures around the world. When you think about food and foodies and um, I, I had been to Mark's store several times and it's just fabulous and I had seen his book and so to have a combination person who is an author and is interested in food, perfect fit. Uh, hi, I'm Mark Bitterman. I'm here with uh, Bitterman Salt Company out of Portland, Oregon um, and also I have a shop in town called The Meadow. Uh, we've been around since about 2006. We specialize in salt, chocolate, cocktail bitters and fresh cut flowers. So I like to kid around that we specialize in the elemental things you can't live without. Um, and today we're going to be doing a little bit of an exploration of craft made salts. So we'll look at uh, what salt is. Uh, we think we know what it is, but the way we grew up, um, maybe we don't. And uh, we'll uh, look at the different types and how to use them in cooking so that everything tastes better at home. So my goal for today is that by the end of the day, everyone's going to come straight away, go home, open up their covers and throw away their table salt. And then what they're gonna do instead is put in something natural and, and beautiful and created sustainably that has a connection to their passion for food and, and feeding people. And so that'll be our mission today. Bitterman is a James Beard award-winning author of this book. He's authored several other books as well. But I was just saying to him, I don't think of him as an author as much as I do a foodie entrepreneur. Uh, because he loves food. That's my business card. Yeah, it should be. So he's going to tell you about his shops. His products, his escapades in France, probably, who knows? <laughs> anyway, we are very lucky to have Mark Bitterman here to talk to us tonight. So, thank you. Mark. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me, you guys. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. I just got back, I took uh, two weeks with my sons in Italy and France, and I uh, ended up back at this uh, place where I first discovered, I think, sort of where I discovered at least that I thought more about food than liking it. Uh, I kind of grew up in an era before there were foodies. There wasn't such a thing as, a, as the, there wasn't a word and there wasn't probably even the same kind of concept of sort of the foodie obsessiveness that we have nowadays. So I grew up very um, simply. We grow most of our food in the backyard and we uh, just cooked our own bread and all that kind of good stuff. Baked, I think, is the word, our own bread. and uh, and. I didn't really think that much about food, but I moved to France uh, in my late teens, early 20s, uh, kind of back and forth. I ended up staying there for about seven years and riding all over Europe on a motorcycle. And I, at one point, I found myself in the south of France in this little uh, chateau, and I worked there for years restoring it. And that was where I kind of discovered that food was something that was much more than I thought it was. Uh, I, I always liked food. I was like cooking, but I didn't. I had never seen the ways that foods are connected to people's lives as, as closely. On, on this farm we raised uh, sheep. Uh, I get up in the morning at dawn and the, the, it always had this kind of amazing, almost like haunted ground fog over the ground in, in the, much of the year. And uh, going through the woods and hunted wild boar and foraged for mushrooms and we raised our own ducks and made foie gras and, and, and had all this commerce with winemakers and uh, cheese makers in, in, the, in the area and so this this interconnectedness of things and this the richness of things uh, so I saw this kind of interconnectedness of ingredients and people and places and seasons in a way that was so much richer and more vibrant than anything I'd ever experienced and it just caught my it entranced me frankly 
Um, so what I was saying is I was just got back from, I was just visiting France and I just for the first time in almost over 15 years visited the house where I was staying and we cooked up all this great stuff and in the just casually on the counter are like four beautiful kinds of salts and I was just thinking like it's so it wasn't a thing it wasn't fancy stuff it was just what there was just some bags of salt and there was a little cellar of salt and and I watched the cooking over the next couple of days and they're always just using salt with this beautiful and, and uh, purposeful uh, uh, kind of thought and that was exciting to see like I, maybe I, I thought maybe that I had hallucinated my in my my enchantment with with food and that it was maybe just a story because I've been telling it to people after I have my stories for 10 years now I've been telling people stories about how I fell in love with food and I was like maybe I'm just making this all up I don't have no idea I'm not really sure if I remember this if you say things enough it sounds like it's true but it was all exactly how they left it and it was kind of exciting um, so a little bit about myself I, I've as I mentioned I've got a couple stores uh, on uh, in Portland one on Mississippi one on North 23rd another one in, in New York City uh, just tiny little shops but uh, we look at just a few things salt chocolate bitters uh, flowers that uh, I think people will say well, why those things and the reason why is because I think that they're kind of elemental they're things that I kind of argue that we're like a supermarket we have everything you need uh, <laughs> and but instead of just having a product that we assume you know about, we assume you know what to do with it, that, uh, that really uh, doesn't necessarily represent the product, it's just a random example, uh, we have a huge depth of those products, like 120 salts, like 400 chocolate bars, a couple hundred bitters. And what we're looking at doing is taking this one ingredient and exploring the world through it and exploring culinary traditions and, and people and, 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 and flavors and, and history. So that to me is what these things are all about. I think that it's a little bit of a, it's a little bit foodie like to just regale yourself in the diversity of, in and of itself. What I think is more interesting personally to myself is the people behind the foods and the connections that, that makes and the sense of kind of like excitement and, and adventure that we all get from, from, from exploring them. So that's what our, these little stores do, I hope. Um, and then about a year and a half ago, uh, because the salt side of things was was kind of took on a life of its own, uh, I founded Bitterman Salt Company just to give the salt part of the store its own life. Because we carry salt, uh, chocolates and bitters from all over the world, but the salts are really just things that I personally collected and sourced from all over the world and put into our packages and, and share about them and sell them. So uh, we started that separate company and we launched that uh, in Sir Latab stores nationally and chefs all over the place. And so that's kind of gangbusters. So now I have the second child, aka business, that I have to take care of. And, and I'll tell you one exciting piece of breaking news is I just partnered in a, a new bar opening up in town, Solo Club. If you guys know Bisaws, um, one of the oldest restaurants in Portland, um, recently relocated and next door uh, we're opening up a bar that focuses on, on uh, kind of European style cocktails. And, uh, cocktails with some bitterness to them, some and maybe a bit more light and drinkable, and bitters that, uh, cocktails that are that are kind of organized around lifestyle and about enjoying space and time, not all about fancy mixology and tattoos. It's more like just have a good time, <laughs> relax, and uh, we're here to take care of you. So that bar is opening up sometime in the next few weeks. We'll see. Um, but that's that also blindsided me. I had no idea. I've always loved that culture, obviously, but suddenly it looks like I'm going to be involved, <laughs> more involved. Um, so I hope that my partners know what they're getting themselves into because it's exciting stuff. Um, so today what we, I thought we would do is just do a really brief uh, kind of overview of different kinds of craft salt. And the, the, the idea here is to, I'd like to share a little bit sort of the discovery that I made. Uh, like most of us, we, I grew up with salt as just a word, right? It's just this stuff, salt, end of discussion, and uh, it's white, and scientists call it sodium chloride. That's what salt is. And that's why I grew up, never thought twice about it, and it's the way most people in America grew up. By the way, it's not the way most people elsewhere in the world grew up. Most people elsewhere in the world grew up with salt from something, salt of something, type of salt X, Y, or Z. It's very American that we thought of salt as just salt. So 
it's one of the things I like to disabuse people of is like this kind of self-evident thing that salt is salt. It never has been. In human history, it's always been a very precious, uh, um, uh, difficult to source, very difficult to transport, very strategic, very distinctive ingredient. And it was only in the late 1800s that salt became something a little bit different. It became, uh, uh, what happened is uh, modern chemistry sort of was born. They invented something called the Solvay process, which was a process for breaking apart sodium and chloride into two chemical elements. And then there was a chloralkali process, broke these two things apart. And these two chemical processes were, became the foundation of the modern chemical industry. So until uh, really almost, it was only like a decade ago, maybe it's 15 or so years ago uh, now or more, um, salt was the number one feedstock for the chemical industry. So textiles, glass, pharmaceuticals, electronics, um, uh, many, 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 many things uh, use salt-based products. And uh, pulp and paper, hugely. So uh, that's actually why m many salt works even exist, is just to make paper. So. Um, the, the, the idea that, uh, that it was a food suddenly wasn't as important. What happened was you had this gigantic industry, and this gigantic industry said, we need huge amounts of salt to feed this uh, new industry. So what happened, more, and that coincided with mechanization, right? Suddenly so we have steam-powered machines, and, and then we start to have gasoline power, you know, uh, uh, fuel-powered machines, and these things all started to happen around the same time. So you know, cotton gins, everything started to become mechanized. And so what this did was it turned something which for millennia had been carefully, assiduously uh, created out of, you know, by, by uh, blood, sweat, and tears in, in all corners of the world suddenly became a mass manufactured commodity. And the consumer for that commodity wasn't the food people, it wasn't eaters. The consumer, 96% of the salt that's being manufactured is for the chemical industry. So this shift away from a food to a chemical feedstock was huge and wholesale, and it instantly, almost, very, very, very rapidly wiped out almost all the salt works in the world. So we used to have salt works in every single little nook and cranny and shoreline and, and coast and salt spring uh, and, 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 and salt deposit all over the world, they were all wiped out by large-scale industrial salt works. And the number went from, a good example would be in Japan, salt works went from, I think the number was there were 20,000 salt works along the coast, works of, uh, coast of Japan. And a little bit later on in the rest of the world, they went down to uh, like a dozen of these huge you know, chemical uh, uh, salt refineries. So we Americans, you know, we're, we're a new culture. We didn't have the same food traditions as other people. So really, food in America was largely involved. You know, we, we, we fell in love with processed food in the uh, early 20th centuries for good reason. It standardized things. It made it healthier. Uh, did a lot of good things that we were looking for. But uh, our food ways sort of started to evolve after that. And it wasn't really until like the 70s that we started to get kind of like a a richer, more nuanced culinary tradition, we started to pay attention to the integrity of ingredients and, and think more seriously about food. So we all grew up in, a, in, in this unquestioning era when salt was just this chemical feedstock. It sounds funny, but it's a complete historical anomaly and it's by and large a geographical and cultural anomaly. So today we're gonna kind of just drop that whole idea. And uh, I think that if I have any single objective for you guys today is that every single one of you you go straight home, you open up your cupboard, you take your thing of Morton's or kosher salt, <laughs> and you just throw it in the garbage. <laughs> and it sounds funny, but what I'm asking you to do is throw a dollar away so that you can have better tasting food it's in, 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 in more better nutrition. So I'm deadly serious when I say that. I think it, should, it's, it doesn't belong in your cupboard, but we'll talk about that why. And I, and I love to preach, so I'm, I'm, I, I love opposition, but I will preach a little bit. So what we'll do today is we'll uh, do a brief, and sometimes we do this, uh, this tasting with bread and butter and cucumbers, and I, so I apologize if you guys were expecting to have nice little snacks. It's a nice format for this, but also, honestly, we can do this just, you'll see, and you'll get it, and it won't matter much, because. A lot of this we're looking at is the principle of the matter. There's no right and wrong. There's no perfection in tasting what your way to things. This is very personal. So I would hope that when we taste our way through these six salts today, 
you're going to be like, dang, this one's my jam. Um, and you're going to just find something that sings to you. And you're going to be using your imagination, right? Because you're just going to be tasting a little crystal or two and kind of listening to how I'm describing we use it. And you'll come to your own conclusions. Um, but that said, I do have uh, little coupons to make it worth your while to drive into town. You can use them online, too. But you can go in and visit the stores and, and get uh, discount sale and buy some goodies and, and, and stock your house. So the first salt that we have that we'll taste, and the way we're going to do this is I'm going to pass these around, zing, 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 probably pass two rounds at a time, one from over here and one from the back forward, is we have these things. These are uh, salt spoons. <laughs> so you take your salt spoon and just get a tiny little bit on there. You don't want very much because you just want to taste it and tap it on your hand and pass it along. And you can tap it on the hands of your friends as well. In all sincerity, we could all be pinching out of these things. Salt is extraordinarily antimicrobial. Um, it's, 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 it's only bleach really rivals it. So you can't get germs off of salt. It's not, germs die. It, it, it kills germs. Uh, but we're being fastidious and, and kind of public facing with this. We were all in a living room together at my house and be using fingers. <laughs> I don't think so. I think we're good. Thanks. So, this first salt is called fleur de sel. So, have you guys familiar with that term, fleur de sel? Like, show of hands just so we know, kind of, yeah, Portland. Uh, so, um, fleur de sel is a type of salt, means flower of salt. Um, or salt flour in French. And that I, I used, this is my favorite thing, is I used to think, and I've researched this for years, and I'm, why are they calling it flour of salt? And there were these myths floating around in different parts of the world, especially in France, that when the salt is evaporating, there is this uh, subtle, subtle aroma of, um, uh, shoot, what's the blue colored flour? Let's call it corn flour, but not lavender, nothing. But it was, uh huh? Little bit? Oh. Dang it. It's been a while since I told this story. But um, <laughs> the subtle aroma of this, of this, of this uh, beautiful flower. But um, one of the things I always thought about was it's funny because those flowers don't have a lot of aroma. You can never really tell what the hell they smell like in the first place. And second, I went to salt works after salt works after salt works, and I'm like, you know, and I'm like not getting it. It's like it smells like it's like a like a marsh, you know. Um, but uh, it, th th that's not where the, the name comes from. Flower of salt actually comes from the uh, the fact that when the salt is made, what happens? You take seawater in from the ocean, and the ocean, by the way, is about 3.2 percent salinity. You pass it uh, across a series of ponds from one pond to the next pond to the next pond, and as uh, the air and sun beat on that water, it evaporates off more and more water until you have a concentrated brine. When you get down to about 28% salt, so you've kind of tenfold reduction in, in, uh, in, in uh, salinity in, in, uh, in the water. The end, you have these perfectly defined flat ponds, they call pans. They're about an inch deep. They're about uh, 15 feet by 15 feet or so. And you fill them up with that concentrated brine. And on the right time, right day, on a nice hot day with a little bit of a ruffling of, of a breeze on the water, the salt crystals will blossom, will flower on the surface of the water. So the magic of the salt is you see that these crystals are kind of small, but some, there's a chunk or two. So they're very irregular. And if you look at these very closely, they kind of a microscope, you'll see that every chunk is actually kind of a concatenation of other little chunks. So it has this kind of snowflake-like complexity. So it's the simplest salt in a lot of ways. I was going to call it humble, but for many years it's been so precious and so uh, hard to make and so hard to find that they called it the king of, the, uh, the king of salts or the king's salt, because only the king could afford it. Um, so very, very, very special salt after all, but looks simple enough. But it's that delicacy. The beauty of this is that it's not a coarse salt that's ground down mechanically. It's naturally formed delicate like that. 
So what happens with those small crystals, if you think about this in your mouth, is the small crystals dissolve, and the larger ones, and the larger ones, and the larger ones. You're getting this kind of modulated saltiness. Very um, different. You put uh, iodized table salt on your mouth. Every single crystal is identical. And it hits your mouth like this kind of blunt object, just like, bleh, done. That's all it has to do. Um, very inelegant. And uh, the other thing about this salt is it has uh, a lot of moisture in it. The moisture means that it dissolves a little bit slower. It it's already has moisture in it, so it doesn't just pull moisture out of your tongue or out of your food. It's actually kind of comfortable, so it dissolves slowly. It gives you kind of, uh, it just slows it all down. Then the last thing about it is it's high in minerals. This has about 7% trace minerals. And what that means is that the saltiness that you are getting is balanced. And th uh, if you think about evolutionary biology, like I say it's balanced, like what does that mean? Is that a subjective thing? Well, we've been eating salt for millions of years. And for millions of years, it's been something like this. It's had something akin to this. And so when we taste it, our mouth goes, yep, dead on, perfect. Um, you taste kosher salt or table salt, it's refined sodium chloride, 99.999 plus percent, uh, pure sodium chloride, unless they've added additives to it, which I get to in a minute. Um, and that's not natural. So it tastes acrid and biting and sharp and, un and unpleasant. And, it's, and this is a subjective. Like, any, I've never in my life had two people taste, you taste this and then you taste iodized table salt. No one says, oh, I prefer the iodized table salt. It's, just, <laughs> it's not, you don't have to be a fancy foodie to think it. It's just like, no, this just tastes kind of good. And I can imagine kind of jumping on that. And uh, the iodized table salt, not so much. So um, the, the upshot is that you have this nice kind of fine salt with a little bit of resiliency on food that is a fantastic all-purpose salt. So, uh, or all it's finishing salt. So you use this on your toast and butter. You put this on cooked vegetables. You put this on fish or pork, uh, kind of lighter bodied foods. It does a great, great job. Scrambled eggs, fantastic. Um, the idea here is that this will give you this gentle, modulated, balanced saltiness. Uh, there's some chemistry behind this too, which is that despite what the kind of salt is salt kind of uh, wisdom people have to say or think, um, not just sodium chloride contributes to the chemical reactions that happens in food to develop flavor. So uh, magnesium, potassium, other salts play a role too. Calcium, they all play roles. Uh, even sulfates and things like that play roles. So when you're using just sodium chloride, uh, the equivalent would be like, you know, have you ever seen like with the stereo system, you've got that equalizer with all the little levers and you slide them all and you kind of make your little curve and you pretend that you know what you're doing and you're making your stereo sound really good? Um, <laughs> Well, imagine taking all those things and putting all the slides down all the way and taking one and shoving it all the way up. What's your music going to sound like? That's, yeah, right? So instead, with this, you have this full arc, 84 different minerals inside the salt. So flavor is better, it's, and it's simple. And uh, I will say uh, that the other thing I hear from people sometimes is, well, I'm, I'm not that fancy. I just can't, you know, if you put it on food, I can't tell the difference. And that's, I get that. I get that sense of like, it's, I don't call it insecurity, but just kind of like practicality almost. Like, I don't know what, that, what that's all about. But what we're talking about here and what we'll talk about in way more detail is we're not looking to make a subtle improvement in the flavor of your food. I wouldn't be standing here just to talk about a subtle improvement in flavor of your food. And frankly, the fascination for salt is fascinating, fascinating as it is, as uh, an economic driver and as a cultural centerpiece. Um, I personally like to enjoy things. I like to explore life through pleasure. And so I wouldn't be interested. I mean, I can see I'm not an academic, pure and simple. I, I, I would find this subject to be a little bit dry. So what we're gonna look at is how you get all that flavor to make that big of a difference. So with this salt, for example, uh, the basic, t and we'll spend more time on this and we'll go much faster through the other ones. I'll spend a little bit more time on these first couple salts. Uh, the idea here is to use the salt as, whenever possible as a finishing salt. So that really, what a finishing salt means is just a salt that's good to finish food with. So the basic culinary technique we talk about is skewing the use of your salt in cooking toward the end of your food preparation. Uh, many chefs are trained to salt early and often. And it's, it's patently the wrong way to salt. It's very old fashioned, it's been debunked by uh, 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 
by my, my, my molecular, molecular uh, biologists and, and uh, been debunked in many, many different ways because we used to think like you develop flavor. You're developing this flavor and then you add more salt and you develop another layer of flavor. And it sounds so good that everyone's like doing this, but all you're doing is uh, adding too much salt. And if you cook with less salt early on and then add more salt at the end, you, have, you can still get some of the chemical reactions that happen to develop flavor, and we'll talk in some detail about those things. But the most important thing is, is you have the immediacy of the salt in your cooking. So what I like to do is, a, a great example, best example ever, it would be uh, bread and butter. Uh, so this is a, a very, very simple cooking process to make bread and butter, right? Uh, so what I would suggest, for example, is one more of these things I'll, I'll say to never do again or to do again, is uh, never buy uh, salted butter. If you talk to chefs, this is one area they really know something, no one uses it. Talk to bakers, talk to cooks. Um, all salted butter is, is perfectly good sweet cream butter with refined sodium chloride stirred into it. And it doesn't like save you any money, it, doesn't, it, it saves you one step, which is salting your food, which is the one step you don't want to be saved. Salting your food is the single most effective thing you can do to improve the flavor of it, so you want to do it. So. Uh, toast and butter, salt and bu uh, butter and toast, butter and bread, is, uh, or toast, is toast your bread or don't, spread it with butter, sprinkle for the cell on top. So this is the great thing you guys can try yourself at home, is go ahead, take your salted butter if you have some <laughs> laying around, butter your bread and eat it. Then take some unsalted butter, butter your bread, sprinkle a little bit of fleur de sel on top. Don't have to go crazy, just whatever you think's nice, a little touch. It's one of these things again, it is a dramatic change in the flavor of the salt. Instead of having this kind of ambiguous, not so sure what I'm tasting, got some buttery thing going on, you've got this, these crystals, these granular crystals, these delicate granular crystals of, crystals of salt that are like penetrating through that butteriness and bringing out all that rich dairy flavor. And then they, they continue, they persist because they're granular and you get a little bit more and it brings out the nutty, uh, grainy flavors of your bread. And you get this really complex, delicious thing and you're eating bread and butter. So that would be an example of where using the right salt well gives you not a slight improvement, but a dramatic improvement in your, cook in your cooking. Um, simple other example would be, uh, 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 I don't know, steamed string beans. It's just a great example. Um, you blend, uh, one, uh, scattered around a little bit, but one time when you, when you do want to uh, make sure you're using a little bit of salt earlier on is when you're blanching vegetables. Blanching is when you put something like a green in, in hot boiling water for a second, just to basically shock it and get some color and develop some of the flavor and volatilize basically some of the things in the inlet. So uh, what salt does there is important. If you put water, salt in your blanching water, um, if you think about it, this is uh, chemistry 101, if you put a bunch of vegetables, string beans, into water, string beans are filled with minerals. What those minerals are, mainly potassium by the way, potassium chloride, that's a salt, potassium chloride. If you put something that has some salt in it into water that has no salt in it, what happens? You're pulling nutrients out of your, your, your greens. So not desirable, and, and with nutrients flavor, um, but also nutrients, uh, they both kind of matter. So um, you add a handful of salt into your water, now you have a mass a level of a saturation of sodium uh, and chloride, and it no longer wants to take any potassium or anything else out of your vegetables. So it actually keeps everything right in there where it belongs, it actually even puts a little bit of the salt in there and gives you more balanced flavor. So uh, from a technical standpoint, salt your blanching water. Um, so going back to this uh, salt here, I consider this to be a great all-purpose finishing salt. Historically, that's all it was because fleur de sel is difficult to make and expensive to make. So you get a little tub of it and it costs you 25 bucks and that's fine, frankly. You're only sprinkling a little bit at a time. It's a, it's a penny or two a serving, no big deal. A penny or five a serving, um, depending on how much salt you like. Um, but that's the basic gist of it. But uh, until recently, that's what I, all I would say is it's a great finishing salt. Uh, fortunately, I found uh, a salt works down in Guatemala where uh, fleur de sel, it's so hot and this, the salt farm's so well managed that we can make fleur de sel there in large quantities. 
So that salt is now available. It's one of the ones that I like to preach about is we sell it in our store. It's kind of our flagship product, but you can now cook with a fleur de sel. Use that as your everyday cooking salt and your everything that you're going to be doing. Uh, another example would be uh, people say, well, even in your pasta water, should I just at least use my junky kosher salt in pasta water? Because who can taste it? Who cares? You know, what's the difference? Um, but the difference is definitely remarkable. For example, I mean, you can taste them side by side and you can taste the difference. Uh, the other difference is that I keep thinking about it. It's like, why would I want to use a processed chemical in my pasta water? It, it's, we don't think of it as one because we were inured to that. We were raised thinking of it as salt, but it's not. It's a processed chemical. It comes out of a chemical industry. The way they make it is kind of fascinating. You take uh, a salt, you find a salt deposit, you pump water into it. What comes out of that salt deposit is a brine. You take that brine, but because, remember, the, the way you process things, we're always thinking about the chemical industry's ways of doing things. They add some uh, chemical agents to the brine to refine it to pure sodium chloride. So it's a chemically refined brine that then is boiled off in these series vacuum evaporators that use a lot of fossil fuels until you get salt. So you have a fossil, you have a fossil fuel intensive refined chemical that I would just probably say, well, why would I want to put that in my pasta water either? Um, but so this is an alternative. It's just sun and ocean in the middle of a mangrove forest. It looks kind of like a beautiful farm what it is. So my argument would be to use that for everything. Uh, post water is another thing where you do want to salt. Um, it's one of the few areas where I actually advocate salting heavily um, because it helps to uh, basically develop the full flavor of the pasta. The Italian way of doing pasta is that pasta is a foundation. Like you don't have, like we do bolognese sauce, you know, there's like this pasta garden, gigantic pile of, of, of bolognese sauce on top of some noodles that are kind of being crushed underneath that. And I like my, my sauce too. That's very un-Italian. Italian is a thin coating of really beautiful, fresh <laughs> sauce over the noodles. And the noodles are, have enough seasoning in them to be a foundation for all that. So it's an ec economic and, and authentic way. All you need is a little bit of fresh tomato and uh, a little bit of uh, maybe sauteed garlic and, so, and some, diced, uh, some sliced uh, basil and maybe a sprinkle of Parmesan, you've got like the best pasta in the world, and it's, and it's the salt that makes that happen. So, uh, and by the way, if you talk to, if you ask an Italian mama what, how much salt they put in their pasta water, they say to the, to the taste of the sea. So it's a beautiful tradition. That's 3% salt. So if you think about it, a pot of water like that, say it's that full, that big around, it's a small handful of salt. It's not a tablespoon of salt. So think about that when you're trying. And I would encourage you to be, to even try to be a little crazy once. You may get something that's a little too salty, but pushing yourself a little bit past your comfort zone is a great way to get amazing tasting pasta. Um, and I'll just now add a brief disclaimer, which is to say that I personally am not an advocate of using lots of salt in life. I love really beautiful salts used thoughtfully. Uh, so in general, probably I consume somewhat less salt than many people. Uh, just because I'm so thoughtful about it. Um, but it's all to your taste. This next baby is a flake salt. I'll pass it this way. And I'll take a little bit for myself just so I can do show and tell or pseudo show and tell. But this pass this one the other way. You want to pass this one around? Thank you. So with the first salt, this is kind of a powdery example, but you can kind of get it. You can even just not use the spoon and try to just tap a little bit onto your hand. You might get slightly better results uh, with this salt. It's very, very light. Um, yeah, I think that might work for you. So this salt here, where the first salt was granular, uh, this salt here is flaky. And you, you'll see it's quite fine, but they're basically microscopic little thin flakes of salt. And so what happens when this hits your tongue it just goes bam. It just pops and then dissolves and disappears. So we talked about fleur de sel having that granular crystal and that moisture, both of which contribute to it having some persistency, so it kind of laughs in food, which is why I love it on butter. Instead of just vanishing, I get it as I bite. I get that little crunch, that little glint, that little minerally glint. So this salt here, fantastic on a um, best example I could think of would be a, a fresh salad. So 
we talked about this technique, this principle of using, of skewing the use of your salt toward the end of your food preparation. So one of the best kept secrets is salad dressing. Uh, do you guys mostly make your own dressing? Mix, buying, and making? I'm a salad freak. And uh, so I'll give you my, my, my uh, quick and, 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 and easy best salad dressing recipe ever. Uh, it's just macerated shallot vinaigrette. So shallots are one of the best kept secrets in cooking. It's one of chefs, what chefs rely on to make everything taste so good. Um, you take a shallot, uh, when you get home, before you even like take, unpack your groceries or make your martini, whatever you do first, <laughs> um, uh, take a shallot and just slice it thinly or even just mince it up, one or the other, makes no difference. And put it into a cup and cover it with vinegar. And just do that right away when you get home. Don't even think about it. Just throw it in there, walk away, do what you need to do, uh, give yourself some time. But what you're gonna do is you're gonna let that, uh, that shallot macerate in vinegar. And that maceration process, basically the acid in the vinegar is reacting with the starches in the, uh, the shallot to create sugars. And it plumps up and gets sweet and complex as all get out. So that's a little a flavor foundation for your salad dressing. Yeah? What type of vinegar do you use? Funny thing is, the question is, what type of vinegar do I use? Interestingly enough, I, I'm very, I, I'm a vinegar freak, so I've got 50 at home, uh, <laughs> literally. Uh, but it doesn't, a good vinegar is great for a certain, you know, a beautiful, you know, pomegranate or, or raspberry or champagne or depending on your salad. But honestly, for a simple salad, cider vinegar is a great default. So uh, if I'm just making, you know, butter leaf lettuce salad and it's going to go on the side of something, I'm cooking up whatever, growing up some sausage or something, I'll just use cider vinegar a lot. Um, the, the, the thing that's going to happen is that, that shallot's going to add a ton of flavor complexity. And then uh, the next thing is uh, you, when you're ready to make your dressing and eat, take a dollop of Dijon mustard and then fill it to taste with olive oil. So this is a funny trick. You think about it. It's like if you like an acidic dressing, use less olive oil. If you like a less acidic dressing, use more olive oil. It's that easy. Um, that you just dial to your personal preference. I like pretty acidic dressing, but it's just a matter of taste, or it's also a matter of what salad you're making. And so now you've made a salad dressing, but by the way, that's probably according to tradition, technically not even a dressing. Uh, salad comes from the Greek word salata, which means salted. So salad is actually just a salted vegetable dish. That's what it means. Um, what we've done with this dressing is not include the salt. So now dress your salad, and incidentally, think about the logic of this. When you're putting salad, uh, salt in your dressing, which is normal, it's in all the store-bought dressings, it's in all the salad dressing recipes, what happens when you put salt on greens? It wilts them quickly. So you're basically shellacking your sweet little greens up one side and down the other with salt. So by making your dressing this way, and by the way, for the record, I will sometimes put a cheater pinch of salt in, just a tiny little bit, just to help it gel together a little bit, but not more than that. Then you dress your salad, and you toss it up, and you serve it, or you leave it in the bowl, but I like to serve it first, and then sprinkle that flake salt on top. Now what you have is this crazy little lacework of these parchment fine crystals that are kind of just balancing on the surface of the salad. And when you bite, you get that pop. And what I love is that you get that pop, but then it disappears. So it, excites and entices your palate, develops flavor, and then gets out of the way so your vegetables come forward. And it's, it is such a dynamic experience, you won't, get, you won't believe it. It's a very, very different salad. Um, it tastes, and what I love also is, by the way, instead of the, the salt wilting your greens, that crispy texture of the, of the salt crystal, the flake salt crystal, actually accentuates the perception of the fresh crispiness of your greens. So it makes a better salad. Uh, this is one easy, good example. So that macerated shallot vinaigrette thing, I, to me, I mean, I make it four or five nights a week, and it's just totally unthinking. I'm very unchefy about it. I just boom, boom, boom. I just throw it in a cup. I carry it in vinegar, and I walk away, and then I just add what I want to later on. Um, the chefiest I get would be choosing my vinegar. Um, <laughs> Um, or my girlfriend will come over and then she puts tahini in it and other things and we get all artsy fartsy, but, uh, but that's fine. Uh, this, so that flake salt, fantastic. I think of it as a, wherever I want that bright, crisp, uh, uh, snappy texture. The 
Uh, other thing that it's great for, which we should not forget, because it's one of the most important things in life, is the rim of a cocktail. Uh, so it's, I, go, I go back again to the whole uh, what bars and pros use in restaurants. They're all using this like kosher salt. Um, kosher salt, 100% refined sodium chloride. And it's designed, it's called koshering salt. Technically, it's designed to kosher. It's designed to dehydrate and uh, break down the proteins in something, break them apart, and extract moisture. It's designed to kosher foods. And so when you put that on your lips, it's going to try to kosher your lips. <laughs> and, it's, and it's what it tastes like, right? You, if you've, you've seen that salty rim, and you're like trying to get at it, and you're like afraid, you're like, OK, and you go for it. You're like, get a head rush, and uh, your lips are burning. And it's like, I don't, why don't I want my lips to be burning and have a head rush and feel all weird? I just want to drink, please. So, um, so using a, a, a quality flake salt like that makes a huge, huge difference. And it's one of the controls you have, it's one of the things that you can do that uh, creatively is using different salts on rims. But a flake salt, there are many different kinds of flake salts. By the way, that's just one of the most delicate examples. There's flakes that are, get this, we'll see a bigger one in a minute. So uh, this next salt we're passing around is called uh, cell gris, or gray salt. And uh, it's the salt that I discovered salt with. Uh, I'll tell you the story really quickly because it's kind of to me, it's just emblematic of what salt's all about. And, and then we'll burn through these last uh, salts. So I was never a salt person and never thought twice about salt. But one day, I was riding on my motorcycle through the north of France. And I normally would just be eating, snacking on whatever cheap stuff I could get, stale food. And uh, I was living very low budge and uh, camping. But uh, once in a while, I would just kind of like say, look, it's important to eat something good once in a while. And, indulge myself, so I stop at a truck stop. And the truck stops in France are called relays, and they so serve very good local food. It's not like a truck stop, like we're thinking here. <laughs> um, but it's still a very humble restaurant. They're designed for truckers. They're very inexpensive. And I ordered a steak, and I took a bite of it, and I realized about five minutes later that I was like somewhere out of body, like hovering around. <laughs> and uh, I had never tasted anything that could compare to this in my life. And I asked the waiter, I'm like, so dude, like, what is this steak? And he's like, it is a cow. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, OK, thanks. You're great. Nice guy. Um, and I, I passed him for a little bit longer. And he's like, finally, he's like, look, it's a steak. It's grilled. And I'm like, well, how, what is your seasoning? What do you, what do you, how is the, what's the recipe? And he's like, it's just salted. That's all. It's just grilled steak with salt on it. And I look more carefully at it, and it, the steak has these chunky, coarse, silvery crystals that are sitting there in these little wells of moisture on, on the steak. And I take another bite, and I get this insane, briny, like oceanic crunch. And then there's this rich, fatty flavor of the steak. And then there's like another little inflection of this briny saltiness. And then there's this steak. And every bite I'm taking, it's evolving and, 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 and shining deeper flavor into the steak. And I never thought, I never had anything like it. I just didn't even know it was possible. Going back to the very, the promise at the beginning of this whole thing, not a subtle improvement in the flavor of the steak. This wasn't something that took any thought, took any sophistication. It was mind-blowing. And uh, so I asked the guy, well, where does this salt come from? And he tells me that it was a, fan, of course, being France, it was a friend of the family uh, or a family member. And uh, I drove out to the coast and met this guy. And, and that's where I kind of fell in love with salt. So this salt here is uh, coarse. You, I wouldn't put that on my scrambled eggs. I think that would be really kind of, it would just be too much. It would, I'd be afraid of it. I wouldn't put it on my steamed greens. It'd just be like kind of as gnarly, huge, crunchy salt that's interfering with my salt, uh, my food. I never, ever want, not never, ever, sometimes, but in general, I don't want my salt to be the star of the show. I want my food to be the star of the show. So. You try this though on a steak, you put this on a, in a roast. One of my favorite examples is naked chicken. Rub the inside cavity really, really lavishly with this coarse salt. It pulls all this moisture in through the bones. It releases all this flavor to all the connective tissue where all the flavor really is. And you get this fan, and then, and then it, when you serve, you carve the chicken, sprinkle a little bit of coarse salt on top. Uh, lamb, leg of lamb, uh, roasted root vegetables, these big hearty dishes, this salt's fantastic. 
So you use it where you want to have something that is stand that wants to compete with your food, and, and on, on its own terms. Uh, one of the uh, it's also good for certain types of cool things like say uh, curing like you want to make uh, lemon salt cured lemons. One of my favorite dishes to do. Take a lemon. Uh, there's recipes in the book by the way, um, and I can send them to you too for free. Um, you just slice it up, uh, pack it in jar with a whole bunch of this coarse gray salt. The salt slowly, partially dissolves, and over the course of the month, you get these fantastic salty lemons, which I then use as salt. They're just lemon-shaped, lemon-flavored salt. And you can mince that up and put that on tagine or in, uh, uh, on roasts, uh, even on desserts. It's a fantastic salty lemon. Then you can take the salty juice that's left over and dry that out, and you get a lemon salt. So it's pretty fun. So that's the third, and I call those three salts the foundation salt. So those three salts, whenever someone asks you, like, what's the one salt you got to have, my answer is three. Uh, I mean, I don't have one knife. I don't have one pot. And uh, salts are more important for making food flavor, uh, flavor happen in food than salt, than pans or knives. So why wouldn't I have more salts? So that's kind of what, and I, we even have this thing called a foundation set. gives you all three. But those three salts, I think, are what everybody needs. You don't use them all every day. You use that Florida cell probably every single day. And it makes a world of difference. And I'll give you a quick, quick in defense of salt, because you'll hear chefs and uh, uh, cooking shows and food magazines all telling you to use kosher salt. That's like the new hips in salt. If you're really smart, you use kosher salt. And, it's, and the good thing about this, about kosher salt, is it is being used by people who are now thinking about their salt. So for that, that's a great thing. It means I care. I, I don't take this for granted, but it is the wrong one. Uh, and that's what's funny is I, th I always think it's kind of interesting when you have all the pros and all the experts in the whole world, and they're all saying this, this is it, and they're all wrong. And it's sort of the equivalent of you know pre-Copernican times, like, well, the Earth is flat. <laughs> we, know, I mean, we know it is. It's a fact. It's obviously flat. If you look at it, it's flat. And, so that's how things work, and we're, we're good with that, in that, this flat earth sort of thing. Um, kosher salt sort of similar. Uh, the reason why I say that it's wrong and they're wrong, it's not by my standards. That would be judgy and preachy in the wrong way. Uh, it's by their standards, by your standards. Do you want an artificially refined chemical that comes out of the maw of uh, a chemical factory run by a gigantic multinational chemical company, or do you want something that is made from the ocean, raked off by hand in the middle of a forest by people who take uh, uh, multi-generational pride in what they're doing, uh, sustainable made, uh, socially equitable, uh, nutritionally superior, and tastes better. And it's like, well, no chef goes, oh, no, I want the chemical factory stuff. That's what I like. So it's, it's just a lack of, of understanding of the ingredient and, and still a lack of savvy about how to use them. So that's just what's holding people back. Um, and I haven't even talked about iodized table salt. I'm not going to do that today because go on and on and on. So I'm going to pass a couple here in quick succession. Uh, these two here are salts that I think of, the, the last three we're going to taste are more, what I think of as kind of the playful side of things. So we talked about how flake salts can have different textures. So the two salts that I just passed you guys, one of them is black and flaky, one of them is uh, uh, red and granular. The black and flaky salt is called uh, black diamond. and comes from the island of Cyprus. It's just natural. It's, again, solar. Uh, one of the things that I always like to emphasize is I think that whenever possible, why not go with something that's made sustainably? It, to me, it's just a big deal. So when you're looking at a salt, ask yourself, why not? Like, do you want, if, you're, if you were to make a salt, if you want to take seawater off the Oregon coast or off the coast and put it over a fire and boil it off using uh, fossil fuels, it takes about eight pounds of fossil fuels to make one pound of salt. So that's just a lot of fossil fuel going into the environment so you get a pound of salt, where solar takes none, except transportation, which, by the way, is very, very small uh, to put salt on a boat. So that flaky salt, that black salt, made in Cyprus using only solar energy, and then it, it, black color comes from activated charcoal added to the salt. So it's a detoxicant. They actually use it, activated charcoal in poison centers. It takes toxins out of your body. And it gives you this gorgeous, gorgeous, dramatic color. So what I love most about that is the drama. So I use it on pasta, baked potatoes, gnocchi, all these light-colored foods. It gives you this bright, dramatic pop. 
um, but it's also has a very, very, very faint, that activated charcoal has a very faint flavor. So you put it on astringent foods like Brussels sprouts and, and uh, say asparagus, tastes outstanding. So that's a lot of fun. I and mean, that's just to meet the fun side. Then the other uh, salt, the red salt from Hawaii, uh, Molokai red, thank you. Um, that salt there is uh, a true Hawaiian salt, by the way. Many Hawaiian salts don't actually come from Hawaii. It's kind of strange, that's true, but it's actual Hawaiian salt. And it's, uh, it's got this very bold, right, kind of crazy. It's like that big crystal and it's kind of a lot to, to chew on. But you put that on the right food and it's outstanding. So uh, for example, uh, fish, grilled fish, it's fantastic. Pork dishes, it's fantastic. It's actually part of the recipe for Kalua pork. But I love it on pork, and I love the color. I have a pork loin, and I put this beautiful red salt on it. And one of the things that's maybe a little bit counterintuitive is it's great on fruit. So pineapple, melons, mangoes, this beautiful, beautiful red salt with its bold, minerally, oceany flavor is great on sweet things like fruit. And it's an old trick in the South, watermelon and, 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 and salt. Can you use, if using a salt in a grinder will that affect how it behaves? and how you should use it, and also was, is there like a saltiness uh, quotient? So uh, the first part is, I, I personally don't use a grinder, because if I want a fine salt, I get a salt that's already fine. And I mean, you, there's no freshness benefit. Salt doesn't go stale. Um, so you don't need to, but if you do want to grind up a salt, say you've got a coarse salt, it's just you want to use it fine, grind it up and it's going to behave very differently, right? Because now it's going to dissolve instantly. It's not going to give you that crunch. So you would just use it as a fine salt. Um, the thing about the saltiness is that's very much a matter of perception. So for example, when you have that big coarse crystal, maybe of that Hawaiian salt, you might be thinking, dang, that's salty. But uh, it actually has more minerals in it than the flaky salt. Well, that flaky salt's a little bit on the salty side. Actually, I have a f funny thing. Some people think the flaky salt's not salty, and some people think it's very salty. You get extremes on that one. Um, but my point is, is that the crystal is gonna be the thing that really does the most work in forming your sense of saltiness. The mineral profile, not as much. There are some salts that are very, very, very minerally, like a Hawaiian salt called Popohaku Opal. Beautiful salt, 16% trace minerals just packed with minerals and it just tastes buttery and rich and you can kind of like put it on your tongue and, ch and, and crunch it and chew on it and it doesn't taste overly salty so you can get to that but in by and large really it's just the crystal uh, not in any inherent saltiness so your last salt today is yeah smell the one as it goes along it's called Alaska alder smoked it's a flaky salt like the black salt that we tasted, but it's smoked with alderwood. So this is one of my favorite things to work with. You guys will see it's, it's got this spectacular aroma and uh, it's a natural flake sea salt then put into a cold smoker. So you put it laid out on a screen and you run uh, uh, smoke through it and it gets this fantastic oaky, uh, rich campfire barbecue, slightly bacony quality going on. So I use this stuff a lot as a finishing touch. I don't use this too much in cooking, but you can use it in things like brines. Like you brine pork ribs, that's another important thing to use salt on. But most people don't know this, but when your pork loins are, you know, they're very lean. They dry out really fast. So what you wanna do is always brine your ribs. Uh, get some botanicals, some you know, peppercorns, juniper, whatever you want, bay. Um, add salt, uh, to, uh, uh, add some vinegar and or salt to water. And, uh, and then soak your ribs in it overnight or eight hours. And that will help a lot. It'll bring moisture into your ribs and give you more uh, uh, juicier ribs. But, uh, so, but one of the things I'll use is smoke salt for, and I'll use smoke salt for that sometimes so you get extra smoky ribs. But I like to use this a lot at home, especially during the winter when I'm maybe not cooking outdoors as much. So I can cook something at home in the, in the oven take it out and sprinkle this salt. As soon as the uh, heat and moisture, the steam from your, your food hits that salt, just volatilizes all that smoke, you get this gorgeous kind of smoky outdoorsy flavor with your food. So um, uh, that's one good example for it. And also it's kind of like a cheater thing. There are some things that just don't cook well outside. You know, they have like a very fine, delicate fish, like sole or something. That's not gonna live on a grill very well. 
So cook it indoors, sprinkle a little bit of smoke salt on there. Uh, I like it on uh, things, a couple unintuitive things is I love this salt on sweets. So vanilla bean ice cream and uh, just a little, not salty, I'm not gonna salt the heck out of it, but like four crystals. You get this smoky aroma that's kind of like, whoa. And then when it combines with that sweet vanilla flavor, it turns into like a salted caramel experience. Uh, it's like burnt caramel deliciousness. So I'm always looking, because I, I like to cook for people a lot, I'm always looking for ways that I can seem like I'm doing a, more work than I am. <laughs> and so, you know, a little scoop of good haagen vanilla bean ice cream or pistachio ice cream and two flakes of salt, people are like, oh my God, you're an amazing cook. And you're like, yeah, amazing, uh, really tough. But uh, that's the kind of thing I, lo I love to kind of pull those things off. And we're kind of out of time. Uh, but I'll give you uh, one last quick thought about other kind of cooking, which is you guys have heard about Himalayan salt blocks. Mm -hmm. So there's a book over there. Um, I have two books coming out, one in the fall, one in the spring. One's on, on as a cookbook, smaller version of this without all the background on salt, just on recipes and cooking. And then in the spring, I have a new book on salt block cooking called Salt Block Grilling, which is about salt block grilling. And uh, I know we met, my editor and I have a lot of fun cooking up brilliant names for books. <laughs> and uh, so, but salt blocks are these giant blocks of, of, of 600 million year old salt from Pakistan that you can heat up on the grill or a stove top and sear food on. So uh, it's a really fun thing to play with and we have lots of those at the store and we can talk to you guys about that some other day. Maybe the next time I come to make up for my lack of food here, we'll come here with like a burner, we'll do like flank steak and <laughs> on a salt block. Questions? Say that again, please. The Himalayan salt, the big salt. Yes. Instead of Costco, is it a good salt? Yeah, so the question is, is the Himalayan salt a good salt? Um, and it, it absolutely is a good salt. So the, it's become very popular in America. The reason why is because the kind of health food industry has early on, way back in the 70s even, kind of latched onto it and said, wait a second, this is a salt that is made uh, without any additives and it, without anything being taken out of it. And so we should promote this as a natural healthy salt. And it's become very, and it's pink, so it looks natural and healthy. So it became really kind of like the darling child of the health food industry. And so it, and it is absolutely great. It's not refined, it's, it's a good quality salt. We sell lots of it. But I will say that um, any quality natural sea salt will have at least as many minerals in it and at least as little of any unwanted natural impurities. So, because you know, things exist in the atmosphere, everything's in the atmosphere, There's every kind of uh, 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 molecule on Earth, uh, uh, atom on Earth is in food, but natural Himalayan pink salt isn't any purer than any other kind of salt. Um, the disadvantage that it has is that it's kind of a hard, rocky crystal so that fleur de sel we tasted that's so delicate and fine, it doesn't really have that delicacy. So I don't use Himalayan salt very often. The exception for me is when it's very, you can get very finely ground Himalayan salt and then it has amazing adhesion. So popcorn, potato chips, all these like fried foods. Uh, I love, I've got a, I found a deep fat fryer at a yard sale, which is like the death of me now. I'm just frying everything. And, and the Himalayan salt is fantastic on that. Yeah? What kind of salt would you use for like brining a turkey? Yeah, so my, my go-to salt nowadays for brining is either going to be the Florida cell or that coarse gray sea salt, the cell gris. They're both, they're both a beautiful mineral profile, so they give you really developed flavor. They're both affordable, so you know a handful of that in your turkey brine isn't going to set you back. Uh, and they both dissolve fairly quickly, so they do the job. Yeah? Well, tree salting needs. Great question, thank you. You, clearly a man of distinction and intelligence in the crowd. <laughs> uh, question was, what about pre-salting meats? Uh, so that's one of my favorite things, is because I've done classes like in Amarillo, Texas, and Oklahoma City, and it's, it's very serious. It's, like, it's violence erupts in these talks. And uh, so I, I used to be really a purist, like, you know, you don't really need to pre-salt your meat, but I actually don't believe that anymore. I think that it's great to pre-salt your meat, but what I do, is lightly do it. So I'll take a steak uh, and you rub it very lightly with celery or fleur de sel. And you're just getting a 
little sheen of it. And what's going to happen is that salt is going to hit the proteins. It's going to it unravels them. It, it, it denatures them. And that allows, and, and a little bit of salt will draw a little bit of moisture out of that steak. That moisture is rich in protein. So now you have a slightly proteinaceous moisture on the surface of your steak. And when that hits the grill, it gives you that crust. It all bonds up and gives you that beautiful crust. And it develops just enough flavor to help uh, actually create some com additional complexity. But what you don't want to do is season it so much that it's fully seasoned. So you pre-season it lightly, then you serve your steak, slice it up, sprinkle that coarse chunky cell gris on top, and now you've got that vibrancy of that kind of dialogue between the salt and the food. Which brings me to kind of the part of the idea here is that you know, we live in an age of kind of an obsession with the integrity of ingredients. Right? We care, well, there's that whole Portlandia uh, joke about the chicken with its papers. You know? <laughs> we really care about where these things come from. So the idea of just indiscriminately salting the heck out of your food when you're cooking it is disrespectful to these beautiful ingredients. You know, I make roasted peaches with the, and I put some bourbon and some, some brown butter over that and I roast peaches and it's like so good, but a little pinch of salt makes the whole thing come, al come alive. Uh, burying it makes it more the peach. Um, burying something like that under salt would, would be brutal and a crime. So I do pre-season, but, but, but judiciously. With a more finer crystal salt? Finer crystal salt is a little easier because it will disperse quicker and, and dissolve faster. Yeah. Um, yeah, pretty much. Do you have a question? Yes, I have a couple. Uh, so, when I'm baking bread or baking a cake, yes. I'm going to use Florida salt? Yes, that's a great question. So, for baking, uh, my all purpose baking salt is Florida salt. It's easy to use, it's teaspoon for teaspoon ratio. I mean, if you're super crazy about baking, you can weigh it out, but it, it, it translates very, very well. Uh, it does a great job. And uh, there's a, one or two funny little exceptions. So I use, like if I'm making pastry, very, very butter-rich pastry, like a, a pastry, like a pie crust, um, one of my favorite tricks is to take this cell gris, this coarse salt, I'll put some on a counter, I'll crush it with the flat side of a knife, and then I'll put that in my pastry dough. So now what I have is pulverized salt throughout most of my pastry with a few escaped fugitives of coarse salt. And those little, oh, it's, so you get that little glint, you're like, oh, what happened there? <laughs> so that's an awesome little trick. But all purpose, Florida salt. <laughs>